Take your seat and grab your copy of God's Word and join me in the book of Psalms, chapter 73. Psalm chapter 73, we'll begin there in just a few moments. I started wearing uh, contacts, glasses, about middle school, and I don't know if you wear contacts or, or glasses, but you know the process of what it's like to have a routine every night before you go to bed, you take your contacts out, and every morning you gotta, you can't see anything, and you gotta go to the bathroom first, put your eyeballs back in, and now you can begin your day, and I've been doing that process since just middle school, it's just ongoing. Well, with that comes eye exams you gotta go to every year, and so I don't know if you've been to the eye doctor or not, but I'll just describe the process uh, for you if you don't know what that's like. Uh, it's, it's not that fun, but it's something you got to do so you can get your prescription so that you can get more contacts and glasses if you need them. And so uh, the, the part that, that can be frustrating, I think, is when you go to the eye doctor and you, you get your spot and they put the numbers back on the back of the wall. Uh, you know there's numbers back there. You know there's letters that they're asking you to read off but you can't see them. And it's just kind of this frustrating, straining process of trying to figure out what is on that wall. And so uh, with my contacts in, I ace it every time. I mean, just I can get it done. But without my contacts in, I I, I think I'm legally blind. I mean, I I can see up close, but I can't see uh, far away. And so it's just a frustrating thing to know that there are stuff back there, but you can't make out what that is. And so you know something intellectually, but you just can't see it. Well, the psalmist in our uh, message this morning, Psalm 73, it's written by, by Asaph. Uh, Asaph was David's, King David's music guy. He was the chief musician. And he's kind of describing this frustrating process that he knows some things to be true. He knows that God is good. He knows biblical principles, yet as he looks around in his world, they, he just can't see how that is playing out. And so the title of this message this morning is, When What You Know Doesn't Match With What You See. And it's frustrating no matter how you look at it. It can be frustrating uh, not just from an eye exam perspective, but just in life. If you know some stuff about God, but you just don't see these things sometimes play out in your life, it can be frustrating. Well, Asaph's going to kind of express that for us. Uh, I'd like for us to consider a personal challenge. If you look with me in verse 1, it says this, Truly, God is good to Israel. Truly. this This is true. He's good to Israel. To such as are pure in heart. But as for me... My feet had almost stumbled. My steps had nearly slipped. For I was envious of the boastful when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. So here's what he knows. He knows that God is good to Israel. That means God is good to his people. And it's kind of narrowed down even further. He says, to those who are upright in heart, to those who have integrity, to those who... uh, don't have undealt sin, that that there's nothing in open rebellion in their lives before God, that uh, God is good to those people. Don't you know that to be true? Don't we expect that, right? We walk uh, and follow God. We should expect him to uh, respond in blessing, and we expect him to be good uh, as we walk in integrity. Asaph saw himself in this category. Uh, But something seems to go wrong. In verse 2, it says, as for me. As for me, I don't know about anybody else, but as for me, my feet had almost stumbled. Uh, My steps had nearly slipped. Now, by the way, I'm thankful for that word almost. Uh, I'm thankful for those times where we don't just fall on our face, but it's just an almost. It's a, a close call. But what causes him to lose his footing? Well, he's seeing the prosperity of the wicked. He says, I was envious of the boastful. Here's the thing. When you start looking at something too long, man, you start, you know, you start 
getting jealous of their life. You start wishing their life was yours. And uh, in fact, uh, what he's seeing is a violation of a biblical principle. He's got theology down, and it's good theology. He knows God is good, uh, but he's not seeing that work out. In fact, Scripture seems to confirm this, what Asaph knew. Proverbs 3, verse 33 says this, The curse of the Lord is on the house of the wicked, but he blesses the home of the just. That seems like a general expectation, right? He blesses his people, the wicked, those who don't love God, who walk away from him, the but God's curse is upon them. Isaiah 57, verse 21 says, There is no peace, says my God, for the wicked. So when Isaiah says this, he says, This is not what I'm saying, it's what God said. God has said this, there is no peace for the wicked. That is the Hebrew word shalom, peace, wholeness. That's what the godly are supposed to have. Not the wicked. Asaph says, when I saw the prosperity of the wicked, that word, you, you, it's hard to see in English, but that is also the same word for peace, shalom. I saw the shalom of the wicked. I saw God's blessing that's supposed to be reserved for God's people, and it seems to be trickling and flowing down on those who are proud, those who are evil. Now, if you've experienced what Ahab has experienced, that's an unsettling feeling, right? And you look around at everybody else, and you begin to think, man, I, I kind of just would rather have their life uh, and not my own. Things always seem to look off when you focus on the wrong thing. When you start looking somewhere else you shouldn't look, uh, it always distorts. Because here's the thing, you don't have the whole picture. You haven't seen the whole thing. Proverbs 23, verse 17 and 18, I think you'll find some encouragement from this. Do not let your heart envy sinners, but be zealous for the fear of the Lord all the day. For surely there is a hereafter, and your hope will not be cut off. So when you look around and you start beginning envious of someone you know to be someone who doesn't walk with God, someone who doesn't care about going to church, someone who doesn't care anything about any of those things, and yet it looks like God's shalom is raining down on them. I'm telling you this, don't envy that because you don't have the whole picture because there's a hereafter. We see in the present, but there is actually more to come. You believe that, right? There is another life that is coming for us all. And so, uh, don't let your heart envy sinners. And I think there's one of the biggest things in our day that can get you uh, somewhat distorted, that can get you uh, looking at the wrong thing, is social media. If you're on social media, you know there's a lot of people out there that boast, right? And whatever format that you have, right, whether it be a picture, whether it be a video, whether whatever they're just throwing up, I'm telling you, that is is not the whole story. People put out their best and people do these things and I'm telling you if you look at that too long you start becoming envious of somebody really you should never be envious of. And I'll tell you this is a time of year that it, this can present a personal challenge to us all. We begin looking at the wrong stuff and then forget the most important thing. Right, So uh, Thanksgiving, we all had our families together, but I wonder how many people just like this, wondering what's out there, and you miss what's right in front of you. And if that was true for you during Thanksgiving, well, you got Christmas and other holidays, that doesn't have to be the, the case for you. As we celebrate Jesus Christ, as uh, the incarnation, uh, as we celebrate all of these things, uh, our focus uh, being there. Uh, man, you can miss a lot of good stuff this time of year if you're just envious of everybody else's life. And I'm telling you, social media is a personal challenge uh, for many of us if that's what we're looking at. And uh, we lose our focus on what's really important. And if we're not careful, we'll almost slip and fall ourselves. Um, I'd like for you to consider what I've called the promotion of confusion. There's, there's 
things that seem to prompt this, this, all this advertisement everywhere. So what is Asaph seeing? What's got him so crazy, right? What, what is, what's he looking at that's around him? And you'll find some disturbing observations as you look in these next few texts. Consider this first one in verse 4. For there are no pangs in their death, but their strength is firm. They are not in trouble as other men, nor are they plagued like other men. Well, let's just establish a few things real quick as we uh, kind of work our way through the rest of this psalm. Who is they? Who's the there? Well, that's, that's going to pop up. Well, that's the wicked, right? That's everybody else that he's looking at that is proud, that's boasting, that's wicked. And he says, man, everything just seems to go easy for them. You see that in verse 4? There's no pangs in their death. There's no pain there. Uh, Their strength is firm. They're good. Uh, They're not in trouble as other men, nor are they plagued like other men. I think the other men, he would include himself, right? Notice we always compare everybody else to us. He's not just making a comparison to everybody else. He's saying, man, they're not in all the trouble that I'm in. They're getting their socks blessed off. And uh, that is not happening for me. And then he goes into verse 6. He says, therefore, so here's the result. Pride serves as their necklace. Violence covers them like a garment. And so therefore, because of all this, here's what they get dressed in. Here's what they wear. Pride and violence. Uh, Their success just seems to make them strut their stuff all the more. Uh, So they're acting this way and yet they're getting blessed and that doesn't stop it. In fact, it just promotes it. It just continues and continues. And listen to Proverbs 3.3. Let not mercy and truth forsake you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. So Asaph and the godly, what are they wearing around their necklace? Mercy and truth. But everybody else is wearing pride and violence, but that seems to be where the blessing is. I've written this on the tablet of my heart. This is what I wear, and yet I'm not seeing it for me. Verse 7, here's more. Their eyes bulge with abundance. They have more than their heart could wish. Man, it's one thing for people to just get by but it's another thing man when they got just more than enough and it just keeps flourishing they are living this way and it seems like the blessings just continue to add up blessing upon blessing shalom upon shalom what is going on here have you ever looked at life and thought this is backwards Uh, what is happening in fact it might even cause you to look up to God and think what are you doing you seeing all the what I'm seeing I like the New Living Translations translation of verse 7. It says, these fat cats have everything their hearts could ever wish for. Man, I love that. (laughs) I think that communicates the heart behind this text pretty fairly well uh, in a way we can understand it. These fat cats, they get everything they want. What in the world is happening? It goes even further. Verse 8 says, they scoff and speak wickedly concerning oppression. So they're mocking and about what's right, man, and they're proud of what's wrong. It goes even further. It says, they set their mouth against the heavens, and their tongue walks through the earth. Man, what really chaps him is the fact that not only they just speak uh, you know, evil about what's good, and they speak good about what's evil, they're boasting against the heavens, right? They're blatantly speaking against God. And their tongue is just walking throughout the whole earth. I mean, they're getting away with it. They're, they're, they're advertising this everywhere. And nothing bad is happening to them. I'm sitting there waiting on the other end of my phone, waiting for something bad to happen, and nothing bad's happening. Every picture, everything gets, keeps putting out is just more blessing upon blessings. Have you seen this principle play out around you at all? Can you share an Asaph's frustration? I think every every person, the people of God, have faced this frustration no matter what time period they find themselves in. It seems like things are just turned upside down. 
The problem with focusing on the wrong thing is that all that confusion, you know what it's going to lead to? Complaining. Now, you just heard a rant, didn't you? And you might think, yeah, he, he, that's, I ran about those things too. ASAP, I hear you, brother. Preach it louder for us in the back row. I'm all there with you. But yet, if you focus and continue to focus on that, all that confusion, all that distortion, you know what it's going to give way to? Just complaining and complaining about your own situation. Isn't that always true? You start looking at somewhere else and you forget the good stuff that you got right in front of you. You forget that God really is good to his people. And as you're focused on everything that's out there, all you do is complain about what God is doing in your life or complain about what God is doing in your church. But the other churches look at, and then we just, we, we lose focus and we lose track of what God wants us to put our focus on that's seemingly just right before us. Consider some of these uh, distressing thoughts as he continues to internalize this. If you'll look with me in verse 10, it says, uh, Therefore his people return here, and waters of a full cup are drained by them. They just consume everything. And they say, how does God know, and is there knowledge in the Most High? Right? God doesn't see with this. I can get away with anything. Is there really knowledge? Is there really anything going on up there in the sky? God's not doing nothing. And Asaph says in verse 12, Behold, look here, these are the ungodly who are always at ease. They increase in riches. Isn't that frustrating? <laughs> it just keeps getting worse. And there, notice what he thinks about himself. Surely I have cleansed my heart in vain and washed my hands in innocence. For all day long I have been plagued and chastened every morning. So if the above is true, you know what he's saying? I've been living for God for nothing. Man, I've been living the narrow road. I've been following Jesus Christ. I've been doing what I know that I'm supposed to do. Yet the blessing is over there and all the chastening and all the plagues seem to be raining down over here. I'd like to get underneath the blessing cloud where everybody else is at. I'm underneath the cloud that just drops hardship. I'm underneath the cloud that drops financial hardship. I'm underneath the cloud that doesn't give promotions. I'm underneath the cloud that just gives out suffering. Because the cloud that's over there seems to be dropping all the blessing. Especially on those who don't even deserve it. Now can you feel Asaph's frustration even more so? Where is this at for me? Verse 15, it gets worse. He says, if I said I would speak this... Right, if I said I would just talk about it, behold, look, I would have been untrue to the generation of your children. Right? I'd be saying something wrong about God's people. So I can't even I can't even pick up a phone and call somebody. I can't even talk about it. I'd just be betraying, right, what has been true throughout time for all of God's people. And so because I'm not seeing it, what's worse is I just got it deep down buried in there and I can't even speak about it. I can't even vent to anybody else and then notice something drastic happens when I thought how to understand this in verse 16 it was too painful for me I, I just couldn't understand it just too frustrating and then verse 17 thank God for verse 17 until I went into the sanctuary of God then I understood their end so everything changes for ASAP until he goes into the sanctuary, until he goes and gets before God, until he gets in God's presence, and then that seems to change it all. Have you ever been in just some troubling times, some stuff, whatever it be, and then you just go to hit your face before Almighty God and you just pour all that out, and then you just get back up and you're like, man, I'm, I'm good. <laughs> I'm better now because of that. Well, Asaph seems to have one of these moments where he's like, I'm just too frustrated. But he takes all that frustration into the temple. He takes all of that frustration to the very place it needed to go. 
Aren't you glad that God can handle all those feelings and thoughts that we have? He's big enough to handle all those things. And so sometimes we just internalize it. We never do anything with it when really the right response is take that frustration. God is big enough. He can handle all of yours, mine, and the whole world's. And we can take all of that, ball that up, and lay it at his feet and get it in, in the presence of God. And then we get back up and we got a whole new fresh outlook. Asaph says, look, I now see their end. I, until I went to the sanctuary of God, I couldn't see it. But now I understand something. The present isn't all there is. Here's the thing. When you know the end, it makes a difference, doesn't it? You ever watched a football game after you already know the outcome? Maybe you recorded that cowboy game, right? You got all excited, but then someone spills the beans at church and it ruins it and you got to go and you're going to go watch it anyway. Well, I don't care how many tense moments are in that game. If you already know the score at the very end, even if it looks like they're going to lose and you know they're going to win, I'm sorry that didn't happen on Thanksgiving, by the way. I just, I had to slip that one in there as an Eagles fan. I just find ways to do that, all right, because I'm a bitter Eagles fan. But you know what I'm talking about. If you've seen games, man, you get some crucial moments. You're like, there's no way they can win this. But if you already know the outcome, you can watch the same game. Everybody else be freaking out, but you're good because you already know what's going to happen, right? It looks like they're, got, they're about to throw, you know, uh, go down three scores here, but I already see what's the turnaround. I already see the progress that's going to be made towards the end of the game. I see that last second play. I see all of it. When you look at the present, if you know the end already, you don't freak out. Here's the thing. Can you imagine if we could see that about our life? By the way, Asaph, that's what God, that's the perspective he got. When he saw the wicked, he wasn't envious of them anymore once he saw their end by the way I think if we that's a healthy perspective when we look at people if we would see them as those in danger of facing the wrath of Almighty God we might not be so envious of them that envy might start turning to mourning that envy might start turning man I, I kind of wish they would find Jesus Christ and they would realize all that stuff is not going to fulfill them if we could see their end from the beginning, we might even share Jesus with them instead of being envious of all they have and what we don't have. Perspective helps a lot. Asaph gets a new perspective. What if we could see our church right now with the end in mind? There may be some of us saying, you know what, I'm not going to leave this place because I know what's coming. There's no way I'm going to go down somewhere else because I can see what God is doing here. Maybe, what if we could see our own lives this way? If we could see the end from the beginning, man, we, we wouldn't freak out as much. Think about just some Old Testament examples real quick. Hang in there with me as I just kind of walk through several of them. Think of Joseph. Remember all the bad stuff that happened to him? He's thrown into a pit, falsely accused, lied about, goes to prison. Could you imagine if he had seen, right, that those dreams will come true, even though they didn't match up with what he was going through at the time? You will be second command of Pharaoh. He can be in that pit and really not freak out at all. Man, could you imagine the children of Israel walking up to the Red Sea, knowing God's going to part it? If they could see that, they might not be freaking out so bad, not thinking, How's God going to get us through this one? Think of the children of Israel right as they were about to come into the promised land, right? Remember, they were right there on the edge, right there on the edge. And they wouldn't go in. They th Those giants are too big. I can't do this. And so they turn around and go back out into the wilderness and die there. And it's their kids that are going to be raised up. And they're the ones that are going to go in because the older ones couldn't believe it. They just couldn't trust God that he was going to help them. But imagine if they could see the end from the beginning, they would have went in, no question about it. Think about your own life right now, that challenge that you're facing. It may be frustrating what you're going through. 
whatever it is that could be very frustrating. But if you get the right perspective on that thing, that who knows what God's going to do with that if you hang in there and trust him with it. Because sometimes before long, what you know is not going to match up with what you're seeing. And many people, that's where they jump out. I'm encouraging us, church, stay in there. Hang in there. See God do what he can do through it. And I love that phrase in the Bible, and it came to pass. And God brought it to pass. Man, that's a good word for us all. If we could see our church, our own lives, from the right perspective. Now, notice this perspective shift as we go through the rest of this psalm. Look in verse 18. Surely. Man, that's the third time that same Hebrew words popped up. It means indeed. It means this is true. Surely you set them in slippery places. He's still talking about the wicked, by the way. You cast them down to destruction. Oh, how they are brought to desolation as in a moment. They are utterly consumed with terrors. As a dream when one awakes... So, Lord, when you awake, you shall despise their image. And so Asaph looks at them and says, you know what? All that blessing I thought that they were getting really underneath what I was seeing is a very slippery ground. Those who don't walk with God, although it may appear one way, I'm telling you that is very slippery. And at any moment, they could fall. And notice this, it's not a fall by accident. It says, you cast them down. God cast them down. God will bring, there will come an end. And it won't be by coincidence because God will bring it to an end. Oh, how they are brought to desolation as in a moment. Here's something else that we need to recognize that's true when we're looking at everyone around us. Although it appears prosperity is happening now, things can change like that. Your world can change in an instant. And by the way, if you're listening to my voice and you don't know Jesus Christ, this is your future. It can happen like that. You might be skating by, everything is good. Preacher, you're, I'm fine. I don't need this stuff. Well, that can change in just a moment. And then it says, they are utterly consumed with terrors as a dream when one awakes. So, Lord, when you awake, you shall despise their image. Man, that is a picture of judgment. And by the way, church family, we have the end. It is written down. And although you may not see everything playing out before your eyes and it looks like justice isn't being done, how are people getting away with everything they're getting away with? We're suffering on the narrow road, I'm telling you. And God's con it may seem upside down right now, but God flips it right side up and we could see that on this side of heaven if we would get that change in perspective in fact the wicked don't have long after all what happened and what appeared to be good for just a, a while over in a moment that'll make your envy go away you may start mourning Notice in verse 21, this is what he realizes now. That's what he knew. This is what he realizes. Thus my heart was grieved and I was vexed in my mind. I was so foolish and ignorant, I was like a beast before you. Have you ever looked back in your life at, at a moment in time and just kind of cringed? And think, what was I thinking? You ever had a moment? I have a bunch of them, unfortunately. Where you can just look back and go, man, it just makes you cringe. What was I thinking? I, was like, I had the mind of a beast. I mean, I had no... Conscious that what my brain was gone. What was I thinking? How foolish I was. Well, Asaph's when he's looking back, he says, What was I thinking? Being envious. What was I doing looking at all this stuff? And I wonder how we would feel, that person we're envious of on social media or whatever it might be, if we could knew that they would what would happen if they were to die without knowing the Lord. We would have been fools for just being envious of everything else and missing what's most important right in front of us. And not only that, uh, we had the wrong outlook on their situation. So I was a fool. I was ignorant. Notice his next realization, verse 23. Nevertheless, I am continually with you. 
You hold me by my right hand. Ah, now we know why he didn't slip. Why did he not slip in the first part? He almost slipped, right? Isn't it good to know God was holding him all along? God holds you and I by our right hand. And thank God for those almost moments. And the reason why we didn't slip or the reason why we didn't crash and burn is because God was holding us up in spite of us. He was doing that for us. He says this, verse 24, You will guide me with your counsel and afterward will receive me to glory. Whew, truly God is good to his people, amen. How about this? He says, afterward you're going to receive me to glory. My outcome is much better than my present. And my outcome is going to be far different from those who don't know Jesus Christ. If we can have that in perspective right now, man, the apostle Paul said this in Romans 8, what's coming, man, isn't even worthy to be compared with our present sufferings. In Romans 8, he talks about suffering. It's not even worthy to be compared with the glory that is coming. No mind is conceived, no ear is heard, no eye is seen what God has prepared for those who love him. That's a great perspective to have. Verse 25 says, Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is none upon earth that I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. That's the attitude of someone who has a healthy perspective. That's the attitude of someone who realizes that if they have God, they have all that they need. In fact, if you have God and you say, I don't have anything else, you say, man, I'm good. Because I, I, I can live without the other stuff, but I can't live without that. And sometimes God seems to have to strip everything else away for us to find that if we all we have is him, then he is all we need. Asaph says, I'm, I'm good. By the way, he says, my flesh and my heart fail. It's not if your health is going to go, it's when. Right? Your flesh is going to fail you. You're, if it hasn't already, or if you haven't already experienced that, I'm speaking to my future self, right? If God tarries, and I'm, however long he wants me to live, my flesh is going to fail. And that is going to happen for us all. It's not if, it's when. But even then, God is faithful. Even then, he is all we need. If you have God, you can make it through every season of life. If you, have, if you know the Lord Jesus Christ, I don't care what you go through, you have all that you need. And when you recognize and realize that, and you look at those who don't know him, instead of being envious, you wish they had what you had. Your, your body might be failing you. And you're thinking, man, they should be envious of me because of what I have waiting for me in glory. Because we know the end. Verse 27, it's much different from those who don't know the Lord. It says, for indeed, those who are far from you shall perish. You have destroyed all those who desert you for harlotry. Those who walk away. But it is good for me. Kind of wraps back around, right? He said, as for me, my feet had almost stumbled. But now he says, but as for me, it's good to draw near to God. I'm not embarrassed by it. I have put my trust in the Lord God. That's past tense. I have already done it. I have put my trust in him. Why? That I may declare all your works. Following Jesus Christ is nothing to be ashamed of. Would you agree with that? I don't care what kind of suffering you think you're going through. And everybody else who doesn't know Jesus, who doesn't care about Jesus, or even hates the fact that we love Jesus... None of that stuff that, that happens should ever make us be ashamed of following him. It is a privilege to know him and walk with him, irregardless of what's going on in our world. And in a world where everyone else seems to celebrate coming out and doing all these other things that we know to be evil, we need all the more Christians coming out celebrating the fact, I'm not ashamed to walk with God. I'm not ashamed of his son, Jesus Christ. I'm not ashamed to stand for him but I'll tell you this notice it's a personal decision he says it's good for me 
Now, I can't come across you and shake you and make this decision for you. But I can agree with ASAP, it's good for me to do the same as well. It's good for me to draw near to God. In fact, when it's times are most frustrating, that's when you're supposed to, right? Draw near to Him when everything seems like it's going south. Why don't you come and get a fresh perspective? Why don't you draw near to God and you'll say, you know what, it wasn't in vain. It's actually something very good. That's a normal reaction of someone who once was blind and can't see, now can see. I love putting a fresh pair of contacts in, man. It just I can see the whole picture. Man, I, I, I put them in, and man, all that fuzzy blurriness goes away. It's, I'm not looking through a dirty windshield anymore. I mean, I see clear. And man, I would hate for someone else to ha have what I had and me not tell them, hey, look, man, I can see, and I wish you could see too. That's what happens when you know the Lord and you're around people that don't. You're not envious. You just want them to be able to see what you can now see. And there's nothing better. Nothing better. Let me ask you as we prepare for our last song, what's the decision for you to be made today? Maybe it's come back to the Lord. Maybe it's to draw near to him. All that frustration has made you like, you know what, I'm closing the Bible. I'm not going to pray. I'm just mad at God right now. I'm just frustrated at my situation. I'm frustrated at the cloud of blessings over there. I'm just frustrated, and you've kind of made up your mind, you know what, I'll go to church, but, man, me and God aren't good. How about today you just make that decision for yourself? Man, it's actually, that's wrong, and it's a good thing for me to draw near to God. And that's a decision only you can make. And... I'd ask you this, consider your focus. This holiday season, as what, all that we're going in, what are you staring at? You can look at what everybody else is doing, or you can be like Asaph and go, man, I, I don't know what, what they're doing. I'm drawing near to God, and there I'm good. Maybe it's put the phones down. Stop missing what's in front of you. And man, you're something good right there. Here's another thing I want to bring out. If I can, if you'll let me just have one more minute to hammer this home. Go public with that decision. Tell somebody, you know what, man, I drew near to God, and man, it was good. How's your relationship with God? Man, go public. Notice he says that last verse. Man, I, I've done all this that I may declare all your works. I'm not ashamed anymore. Man, I once internalized it. I could, man, I felt like I couldn't speak about it. Man, now I can't help but speak. Man, go public with that decision. And if you've ever made a decision for Jesus Christ and you haven't gone public in baptism, that's one way to declare to everybody listening and watching of the work God has done in your life. Would you agree? Go public with What are you ashamed of? Go public with that decision. Who cares of what everybody else thinks? Declare that work. Declare that it was good for you to draw near to God. Go public with him in baptism. Let people know that you're a Christian, right? Come out of the shadows. Now more than ever, we need that. And here's the deal. If what you know is not matching up with what you see, that's all the more time to draw near to God. Let's do that together. Would you stand to your feet? Would you bow your head? And hearts with me and just between you and the Lord, what's that personal decision for you to make? Maybe it's as simply as just drawing near to God today in the midst of frustration. I'm telling you, you'll find it's, that's a good decision to say, I'm going to come to him. Maybe you've never been baptized, but you need to be. Go public. What are you ashamed of? Draw near to him. Declare those works. Whatever that personal decision is for you, this is a great day to be in the house of the Lord and in the sanctuary to get in God's presence and get a whole new fresh outlook. Our Heavenly Father, we come before you. We thank you for our time together in your word today. Thank you for Asaph expressing this underneath the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, just the frustrations of life. But we thank you more than anything. He came back around and encourages us to come back around. We know that 
Asaph's circumstances didn't change, but his heart changed. He could go right back into his situation because of that fresh perspective he got. And Lord, I pray we could get some of that this morning. However you're speaking to us individually, we pray that you would continue to move in our hearts. Pray for personal decisions that would honor Jesus Christ would be made today, would be made right now. We give this time to you. As we draw near to you, would you draw near to us? We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. As we sing our last song, draw near to him. And as you do, you'll find God will draw right near to you. Would you take that first step towards him today as we sing, won't you come?